The, the title of that talk was The Real Asset Big Bang, and, and, I, and, and if I had to summarize it, um, some of the things that we've been discussing here really came from um, what I was preparing for that talk and also the questions that Rick asked, which is that central banks are becoming irrelevant. Um, inflation is going to be whatever it is because of supply and demand and geopolitical factors. And we are in a major energy and technological and national security pivot point, or I call them pulse points, in the world where the requirement for um, an array of supply of natural resources of real assets is only going to continue to grow. Special coverage from the Rule Symposium in Boca Raton, Florida is brought to you by Contango Ore, developing Alaska's next gold mines. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. We're here in Florida at the Boca Raton, or in Boca Raton at the Rule Symposium at the beautiful Boca Raton Resort. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the at JR Mining guy on Twitter and to, of course, host for this conversation. And I'm really looking forward to this one. It's a first time guest on the channel, Dr. Nomi Prince of Prince Sites Global. Nomi, this is phenomenal to meet you. Really looking forward to this conversation. Thanks so much for making the time. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm so excited that we've finally gotten this together. I'm really looking forward to this conversation with you. Yeah, you, I snuck my head into your presentation yesterday and you had a full room. It was phenomenal. And uh, we're going to get into some of the topics of your presentation real quick or during our conversation. But at first, like more of a general question, of course, like I always ask the guests that to see also where your head is at. Like, how are we doing? How, how's the economy doing right now? And what, what are your thoughts? Uh, how, how, how everything's going? Yeah, that's a really great question. I would just to start with the macro, go to the micro. Of course, the economy right now is slowing down um, globally as well as in the United States. The last print officially was a 1.3 percent up on the last quarter for GDP. Um, that's kind of boring. That's not really that's not really massive growth. Um, unemployment has gone up. It's now 4.1 percent. The last time it was that was 2017. So so that is creeping up. Um, there are problems in the banking sector with commercial real estate loans in particular being very problematic right now for regional banks. Um, um, and to an extent for the larger banks that have connections to the regional banks. Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell sort of talked about it a little bit when he was grilled in front of the Senate Banking Committee, um, but he really didn't seem particularly bothered. He's like, oh, this is going to be a problem for a long time. Well, that's kind of exactly the thing that happened in the lead up to the financial crisis of 2008. Then Ben Bernanke said, subprime loans, not a problem. It's fine. It's going to be OK. So I think there are all sorts of problems on the financial side as well as the slowing down on the economic side. Inflation, of course, has come down a bit. I don't think it has anything to do with the Fed's policy. Um, it has to do, I believe, with just an incidental until decrease um, in some of the uh, relative increases. Mm -hmm. So costs are still going up, but just going up uh, a little bit more slowly um, that we've had since the supply chain massive disruption um, during COVID and coming out of that period. Um, so I, I think that we're going to continue to see um, low grade inflation, meaning prices are still going to go up, especially for commodities. And that's going to be a part of what also makes economic cost for, for individuals and, and potentially for investors and for building um, more expensive over time. That is going to, in turn, create more demand for, for commodities at higher prices because those are inflationary um, hedging. But they're also part of longer term economic growth, which is needed right now to basically combat the shorter term anemia that we see coming in growth. Yeah. Very, very topical today. Jerome Powell was uh, sort of uh, in, in front of uh, the Senate. Yeah, Senate uh, Bank. House tomorrow. <laughs> right. Senate today, House tomorrow. Right. But uh, we need to talk about the mandate the Fed has. Inflation and unemployment numbers. Unemployment, let's start there. 4.1% uh, for, for handle on it. Like, how, how serious is that number? Like, I meaning, like, what, what does it tell you? How critical is it? And when should the, the Fed get nervous? Like, is it 5%? Is it 6%? Is it maybe 7%? I was just talking with uh, Lobo Tigre here, sat in your chair like 20 minutes ago, and he was talking about the U U6 unemployment numbers, which is more of a realistic reflection, apparently, of back in the day, like back in the 90s. And that is showing a seven handle. Right. Right. So how, how nervous should the Fed be? And also, he always mentioned he wants to be proactive and not reactive anymore. So I'm curious, like, given that context, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it's very interesting because these were questions that actually came up from the Senate Banking Committee. Um, in fact, the, the idea of, well, unemployment has been ticking up at 4 and now 4.1 percent. That's pretty much where it was uh, pre-COVID. That's where it was in 2017. It's not like it's a phenomenal number. And, and Powell tried to basically kind of shake that off by saying, yes, but the labor market is strong. Yes, but on a, on a large comparative number, it's not that strong. Um, and as you mentioned, the UEC number, which is always higher, um, is accelerating by more. So what that actually means is there are pockets of the labor market that are doing okay. 
right now they tend to be in government related jobs um the government does have funding that is where we are seeing sort of the bulk of the new jobs not all of them other ones are a bit more cyclical you know some are uh, people who work on in um you know resorts and restaurants and so forth you know hiring more in the summer they'll get reduced during the fall you know there's all these cyclical things that happen but for the most part right now uh the numbers are really only coming from debt funding right um, um, government funding so that 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 is a problem that is something the fed should look at um and at least should acknowledge that the labor market isn't hot anymore um and nor has it been for for a number of months that is one part of their dual mandate the second part of their dual mandate of course of is, um, is inflation even if we see monthly tick ups in cpi ppi even even core um personal consumption expenditures which is the the number that the fed tends to look at the numbers are over 2% um when you when you analyze them they're they're ticking up more slowly than they have been in the past but again i think this is in incidental to the fact that we've already seen this rise happen just more slowly over this entire period of time actually that the fed has been raising rates so the way i look at the fed has really not done its mandate the mandate has happened around the fed Um if we could go into two parallel universes and look at these numbers and kind of see what would have happened if the Fed didn't actually raise rates as it did over these two years or whether it um has I I think we would see inflation around the same levels and I don't think the Fed can control they cannot control supply demand chains they cannot control geopolitical events they can't control the weather Powell may think he can control the weather but he actually can't all of these things um really do cause more of a movement on inflation and will continue to then anything the fed can do to quote fight it um or even if the fed were to do nothing and start to lower rates i i think the incidental impact of inflation would be independent um of of any of what the fed is doing right now without the revisions in the jobs report i'm curious like would would paul already have to sort of cut rates already like you, every jobs report has been revised lower it's like by over 100,000 jobs lately is it That's, that's that's crazy. Like I'm curious, does that increase the pressure on them? That's a really good point. And again, that was what what the Senate Banking Committee brought up. Like don't you feel <laughs> um, you know, an obligation to to actually take a look at this? And uh, they were really sort of pushing towards um getting information from him on when when there would be a cut in rates for that and for other reasons. For example, the the massive amount of debt that households are facing, the massive amount of of costs that mortgage um payments are are demanding from individuals, the fact that housing prices have risen anyway, the fact that rent prices have risen in any way the fact that it's more expensive to do everything because of the cost of that debt um and this was all coming up in questions um including you know connected to employment and he kind of just dodged them really um he 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 agreed to all of the individual questions is the unemployment rate rising yes is it more expensive to pay for a mortgage yes mm-hmm. are housing prices rising yes individually he was able to answer correctly um as to what was happening then collectively well does this worry you his answer was well i can't give you information i don't want to give you information is what he said um that can be interpreted as what the fed will do next we will be data dependent <laughs> So it's like but you just said the data is telling you this. <laughs> the data is actually suggesting either you're you're in ineffective or you need to do something and either way that is the data. Um and his response has been to your point of the question to pivot from labor into well yeah but inflation isn't 2% forever. And the reality is it won't be and he even said well last year we had a period of about 5 6 months where we did see a decline and then it popped up again and now we saw it de- decline again so we need a longer term period of of a decline. And I'm thinking watching this, don't you understand that those increases in the rate of inflation along the period of time where you also see decreases are just life. They're just supply and demand. They're just global economics at work. They're just geopolitical factors that are unfolding whether you do anything or not. And it it, it continues to be um just odd to me that he doesn't actually understand that how realistic is a 2% price t- uh, inflation target if i look at it it's like it's, it's it seems to be an arbitrary number that totally. somebody's picked in the in the in the history of the us or in history somebody's picked 2% because it seems to ma- math out like how realistic is it even getting back to that and should we get used to maybe 3% as a new target and what would that do 
that's a really good question. I, I think we should get used to the fact that that the Fed is irrelevant in controlling inflation and where we are, whether that is at two percent or three percent or one and a half percent or four and a half percent at any given time, um, that it will be much more related to the supply curve and not the demand curve. Um, Powell always pivots to, well, we're we're focused on making demand uh, come down relative supply because it costs more, rates are higher, so therefore demand is going to be down. I don't think that's the case. I think supply is in the is in the leadership seat right now, which is why I think the Fed is irrelevant. And I think, um, you know, as, as you know, uh, the 2% inflation number was completely arbitrary. It was a number that was um, basically selected um, in the 90s as some literally arbitrary benchmark. It was not part of the Federal Reserve Act of 1913. It was not part of the dual mandate um, additional language that came up in the 70s. It was not part of anything specific that had anything to do with analyzing the effects of supply chain dynamics on inflation. It is completely arbitrary, um, which is why the, the sort of dogmaticness of, of the idea of, of seeing inflation at a certain level that, that the Fed and Powell in particular continues um, to push forward is, is just so, um, well, ridiculous, really. We're, we're going to see we're going to see the inflation we're going to see regardless of what central banks do. That that's the reality. It could be two, it could be three, it could be one, it could be four, but it will be driven by the supply chain, by the cost of getting commodities out of the ground and into our products by geopolitical factors and a lot of other issues that have nothing to do with central banks. We'll talk geopolitics in a second. A really big topic, of course, yeah. that we could spend hours probably on discussing it. But uh, the role of the Fed moving forward, because we also have U.S. elections, depending on outcome, I think the role of the Fed could change dramatically as well. I'm curious if you have some thoughts on that and the role of the Fed moving forward. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because, again, the, the Senate Banking Committee on on both sides of the aisle today was really kind of trying to see if the Fed were going to reduce the cost of money for, for no. different reasons. One, because of the labor market, unemployment rising, as we've discussed. One, because of the cost of housing and other things going up, as, as we've discussed. And so I think with the election coming up, and it, you know, I'm not going to predict who's going <laughs> to win or not, but, 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 but for example, if there were to be a Trump administration, there would be um, additional pressure on the Fed, as there had been um, when he, he was in office the first time, to have a more easy monetary policy policy. Um, I think that pressure is already on the Fed. And from the standpoint of the Biden administration, there there is this sort of link or the idea of a link. Again, I don't think the Fed can control inflation, but there's this idea that it can and that if the Fed does cut rates, it's going to increase inflation. So there's a little bit of pressure perhaps on the other side for the Fed not to cut rates. But then again, the head of the Senate Banking Committee, who is a Democrat, Sherrod Brown from Ohio, is pushing the Fed effectively to cut rates. So I think ultimately, if there's any political pressure on the Fed, it is to reduce rates for different reasons on both sides of the aisle. And I think whoever is elected to, to the White House in November, um, either way, that that pressure will exist for the Fed to ease. Now, whether the Fed responds to that pressure um, what we saw in the Senate Banking Committee questions to Powell was a lack of response um, remains to be decided. It's it's very possible that Powell decides if unemployment, for example, goes to 4.2 instead of 4.1. That's just too much. We can tick that off of the sort of list of hot labor market. Now it's not. If we get one month of inflation, you know, closer to 2% or just under, he might say, OK, on average, that's enough. I think I think he wants to find an out to not continue to fight inflation, but I also think he strongly believes he can. And I think he's very conflicted on these two things. And whoever is in the White House, um, they'll be on the side of um, watching the Fed to ease policy. Is the Fed nonpartisan? Um, I, th I think it is. I know there's a lot of conversations about both sides. It's going to help the party that's in office. I mean, Ch Chairman Powell was was basically selected by uh, by President Trump, by a Republican president. But he was second in command under Janet Yellen, who was selected by a Democratic president. I mean, there, there is the, the, the Fed is basically, I think, um, fairly bipartisan. Bipartisan, nonpartisan, bipartisan. Bipartisan, bipartisan. nonpartisan. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. No, interesting. Like one last topic I want to talk about is really debt, the US debt situation. Like, of course, we're commodity focused channels. We're always a bit doom and gloom, I have to admit, because we're gold bugs it, like at heart, right? So Same. We, we, <laughs> we want the big crash to right. happen. And that means maybe a debt implosion in the US. Like, how likely is that, though? Like, let, let's look at the US debt situation 34 trillion, 35 trillion dollars US. Is the US insolvent? 
Well, the U.S. can certainly continue to borrow money forever, <laughs> if, if that's what you mean. If Can they pay it back? Probably never. <laughs> um, is the cost of their interest rate payments ridiculous? $900 billion, a trillion dollars worth of basically paying off um, interest, basically servicing debt costs on, on, on a regular basis, which they do before effectively turning the lights on in the United States. You're, you're, you're basically making payments on your treasury debt. And, and that can continue indefinitely. But what it does on the other side is it creates a strong deficit, obviously on paper, but also for, for the growth um, and for how the United States invests. For example, infrastructure investment right now is, is trillions of dollars behind what is what is necessary. I do a lot of work across the aisle mm -hmm. with um, legislation, legislators to um, look at updating and upgrading our infrastructure from power grids to bridges to ports to everything else um, without taking on more debt, finding a way to actually repurpose the debt in order to build. And I think the reluctance to push forward on that is based more on not understanding how you can actually finance growth with the current debt um, versus doing nothing and just watching the cost of future infrastructure upgrades increase by definition. Um, because of the cost of the supply chain and, and inflation and other things. Yeah, it's interesting, like because most of the debt is U.S. owned or domestically owned as well. So, like, yeah. I had a conversation with a friend of mine, and he's like, "Well, we're never going to call our own debt." We're not going to call it. And the Federal Reserve is the largest holder of debt on the planet, yeah. um, <laughs> and it's been very slow. I mean, it has gotten into quantitative tightening, but it's also reduced the speed of that quantitative tightening recently, and um, it's holding more trillions of dollars of debt than it did um, before COVID. And I think it continued to do that. And if we have a banking crisis, um, for which there are a number of factors um, that, that point to that possibility, whether that's just in regional banks, whether that's one big main bank, um, the Fed would be prompted to probably print or, or sort of buy more debt and have even more of that on its balance sheet, um, as we have seen in the past, as we saw last year, uh, last March, when we had two regional banks um, go bankrupt. Let's change tactics a little bit, or gears a little bit. Let's talk geopolitics. Like, w what are the biggest opportunities right now, or the biggest threats to the system in general? I'm curious what your thoughts are. Um, th there's two main things driving geopolitics, um, and they both have to do with different kinds of commodities. Um, mm -hmm. Basically, with with electric commodities or the energy transformation commodities, as well as the clean energy in between commodities, which is uranium. Um, what we saw after the war in Ukraine began was that the United States recognized, as a, a number of nations in Europe, that they can cannot um, trust uh, Russia or, or Kazakhstan to, to basically supply uh, uranium for yeah. nuclear energy. Nuclear energy powers 20% of the electricity in the United States, and a lot of people don't know that unless you're a uranium yeah. producer. And the, the issue was that we had stopped as a nation building new plants. We were seven years um, between like one plant to, to the latest plant that just finished out in Georgia. Um, but since the war started in the Ukraine, the United States has pivoted, has introduced significant legislation, bipartisan legislation, to promote the domestic supply and allied supply of uranium, to promote advanced technologies for making um, nuclear energy provision more uh, specific to a location. So instead of, instead of just having big, large nuclear plants, having small mm -hmm. uh, modular reactors being placed on army bases, being placed potentially in, in, in small areas, small towns to basically use nuclear energy in a more diffuse way as, as more of a power base because nuclear energy is cleaner than um, natural gas, cleaner than oil, cleaner than coal, but it's also more reliable than renewable sources of energy mm -hmm. like solar or wind. So it is there if we build it for that in-between stage, which is where um, where we're going from an economic standpoint as well as an environmental standpoint. Whether or not you believe in climate change or any of that, that is actually what is happening um, in terms of legislation in the United States, in terms of the promise of the U.S. and the U.K. to triple their amount of nuclear energy power usage between now and 2050. There's a tremendous mm -hmm. amount of push in that area. That push, not having Russian Ukrainian, not uranium, not having Kazakhstan uranium, which is basically controlled by Russia, and, and having a domestic allied supply is a huge trend. And it's one of the reasons that uranium outperformed gold and silver and copper and other assets as inflation has stayed high, as debt has stayed high, um, because it's a it has a very strong use value in a very large area of geopolitical focus. So to me, that is a, a sort of no-brainer um, sort of investment to follow for just all of those factors. Um, copper is another one where 
if we have more power grids in order to deliver that energy, um, whether it's renewable, whether it's nuclear, even whether it's um, more efficient ways of using the grid and delivering energy that are, that's currently coming from natural gas or, or oil or coal sources, uh, we need to continue to build uh, more efficient wiring. We need to continue to build the grid, not just in the United States, but throughout the world. And that's trillions of dollars uh, worth of infrastructure building that will require copper. Um, gold and silver, of course, um, has its values. Uh, gold, of course, is a central bank uh, diversifier against the dollar. Silver potentially is another diversifier because it is much cheaper than gold. And a lot of central banks can but don't yet use silver as a diversifier in their portfolios. Um, and of course, silver is such a great conductivity value that it's also going to be a big part of the energy transformation. So these are these are sort of in play um, commodities that are that are very necessary to have for those reasons, um, and then there is the, uh, the the backup play, which which we can talk about, which is what's going on in, in rare earth elements. We'll have to table that one because you know, I really want to quickly zoom out again on the geopolitical side. Are we, are we leading commodity wars? We used to lead Absolutely. a war for oil. Is that now a different commodity war? And uh, how how do we like, look look at that? Like it's an interesting term, of course, the commodity war. But how does that sort of like you mentioned some sanctions and bans on uranium, for example, but in, in the essence, like at the heart of it, it, the whole geopolitical conflict, does it really come down to commodities? It absolutely does, because it, first of all, if you can't power your economy or your military, you're not going to be able to be as efficient or as independent as a nation. You're relying on, on, on other countries. I mean, that, that's one of the reasons we, we, we want our own power supplies. That's one of the reasons we want our own natural resources. That's one of the reasons central banks want their own gold stockpiles to be diversified from the dollar, or at least a little bit. Um, th these are all things that have geopolitical um, connotations. And as the emerging nations continue to upgrade their power bases and to grow their technology bases and to grow their efficiencies and to grow their populations, they require commodities to be able to do that. And the countries that control the commodities also control the prices. Um, and I, I just briefly mentioned rare earths because it's an area where there is such a major commodity war growing because China controls 60% of the rare earth elements on the planet. These are used in your computer, in your iPhone, in LED lights, in, in missile defense systems, in permanent magazines, so in everything. And 90% of the pr processing of, of those elements. That means they control prices. That is a huge possible component of economic disruption. So there is a war going on right now, and it's just starting even on the rare earth side for the US and other allied nations to find their own supply. Um, that's a longer term thing. Right now, the war is happening in copper and uranium and silver and nickel and lithium, um, but it will expand. And these are all commodity wars because without stuff that's coming from the ground, um, whether as a currency diversifier, or a, a trade currency, or, or physical infrastructure, power and defense building, um, countries lose. And also don't control their own um, economics to the extent they could if they had their own supply. Lithium comes to mind when you mentioned like sort of China is at the forefront. They, they, own, they control the processing. We've seen China, the, the lithium price run up to $70,000, I think it was a per ton. And now it's down below 10,000 or right, right around 10,000. Mm -hmm. But that was because I think China turned up the faucet and, and really, or gang, I think it was Gangfen Lithium sort of. That's right. Was at that. I was like, I'm curious if you have some more insights into that because I think it's more of a real life example. Yes. People, a lot of people have been following it while rare earths are, wait, are quite exotic. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. So yeah, lithium yeah. seems to be more of a mass market product. So is that Absolutely. a proper example to use there? Yeah, I, th I think that's a, that's a closer term to now example. It, it, it's the same function of, uh, of what's been happening is that, is that China controls um, a large supply of lithium and also of the processing of lithium. So what happens is therefore they can control the prices. And it's very important actually investing in lithium, which is, is currently, as you said, it's, it's appreciated in price quite substantially over the last year, year and a half, um, to watch what's happening in geopolitics because it's tempting to just think, oh, well, the market isn't interested. Oh, EVs have not been produced as much as expectations, so they don't need as much lithium, so therefore there's less demand. That is the very easy interpretation of missing the entire investment point, which is that, no, if you have a country that controls a significant supply and processing of a particular asset that is needed in a growth area, that's not just EVs. It's, it's, it's basically... Um, it's electric buses, it's electric boats, it's, it's electric missile, it's every battery that, that gets put into anything that's going to be created. Um, and you have one country who can depreciate or appreciate 
uh, the mass supply of that commodity, that's what's going to move the commodity. And that's the other reason why it's important um, to look at how supply chains um, have been growing around the world. And it's one reason why also distribution um, and production capacity for lithium is also very important. It's one reason I was in Brazil a few months ago and um, Elon Musk was having this big fight with the president of Brazil, uh, Lula, because he had allowed a Chinese um, EV company, BYD, um, to uh, basically uh, take a large swath of land outside the um, few hours outside the capital of Brazil to build a massive battery factory and, and to supply that factory with lithium and, and, and process it and so forth. And he's like, why are you doing that for China? Why not me? And, um, and but this is a thing. This this means even with lithium prices down and investors sort of saying what's going on with that, he knew that he needed to get into that additional supply or at least processing chain for, for lithium in order to continue to be competitive over the long term in, well, in EVs. They, they set up their own processing facility in Texas. Yep. I think that tells you everything you need to know. Well, exactly. That there's a massive shortage yes. in processing facilities. Yes, and, and it's capacity. huge. It, I was I was out there. It's massive. It's well guarded. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, it's it, it's 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 a really interesting thing. They, they've sort of changed the street names around it. I mean, it, it's mm. a very large um, you know, sort of gigafactory, and it's not the only one they're yeah. going to be creating. And that's going to require energy, and that's going to require copper. I mean, the, the, all of these things have knock-on effects, but it's because we're in such a transition period in the world from the standpoint of battery tech of power where it's coming from and what it's getting used for we're here at the rule symposium it's a finance conference but it's all heavily commodity focused obviously like and you were on stage yesterday you gave a presentation then there was a bit of q a with rick afterwards mm -hmm. uh run us a bit through the main takeaways what do you want the audience you had a full room by the way it was phenomenal to see Thank um you. take away from it like so the, the title of that talk was The Real Asset Big Bang, and, and, I, and, and if I had to summarize it, um, some of the things that we've been discussing here really came from um, what I was preparing for that talk and also the questions that Rick asked, which is that central banks are becoming irrelevant. Um, inflation is going to be whatever it is because of supply and demand and geopolitical factors. And we are in a major energy and technological and national security pivot point, or I call them pulse points in the world, where the requirement for um, an array of supply of natural resources of real assets is only going to continue to grow maybe not every single day maybe not in a straight line but this is where we're at right now all of these factors are not going to change and i went through the semiconductor industry and, and the factors that are pushing the united states government to fund fabs in the united states to compete with chip manufacturing in china because we used to control 40 percent of the market now we just control 10 and somebody needs to do something um and, and i went through um you know we talked about it here some of the uranium politics that, that are basically behind things. So the net takeaway of that is um, whether or not uh, anyone trusts the government or thinks the government is efficient or whatever it is, that once the government does finally get to a, a sort of agreed upon policy, whether it's the United States or in other nations, specifically in the space, it creates money and private investment follows. What are your preferred vehicles <clears throat> to play those trends? Um, well, I think there's a number of miners um, or mining companies because they have lagged um, some of the commodity prices themselves that are positioned. And this is one of the things I always look for in places where there is, is less geopolitical risk than in other places. Um, so if I'm looking at a silver company or a gold company, I want it to be in a place where there's, there's limited geopolitical risk. And more importantly, um, where there is really good energy economics. And what I mean by that is, um, for example, there, there was a company here, I'm not saying I'm recommending this right now, we are doing analysis on this um, right now, um, though for my, my, my print sites uh, substack, um, IA Silver and Gold. Um, mm -hmm. What was intriguing about that company um, is that they effectively are, uh, a lot of their drilling is driven by wind power. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? It means it's cheap. Mm -hmm. um, it may not it's be clean, 100%. It's cheap. It's it clean and it's boxes. cheap. That's right. And so, I think all of those factors are becoming more important when we look at, again, the mining sector and, and some of those commodities and determining where to, where to put money. It's a little bit more homework, um, but it, it's in keeping with all of these other pulse transitions that are happening in the world. Um, with respect to gold, of course, um, I, th I think gold is something that is, uh, you, you can do it through, again, pure ETFs, but then I'm looking at ETFs that actually have gold behind them or buying portions of gold. Um, th there are companies that are, are very specific about how you buy gold. You don't have to buy an entire gold bar. You don't have to buy an entire ounce, but you get a certificate or something that actually verifies that you have 
pure gold held somewhere with a high grade that is attached to your investments. And silver has has, has similar um, sorts of connotations. So, so I look for real assets that are able to be accessed in, in that way as well. Fantastic. What, what a wonderful conversation. I yeah. really appreciate that we could make the time and that you took the time to, to sit down with us. Really appreciate it. And to, where, where can we find more of your work? Where can we follow you? Well, well, currently the best place is to go to Print Sites, um, my Substack, because I'm, I'm migrating all of my uh, new research um, that will be coming out, my interviews, my analysis, um, boots on the ground. I do a lot of traveling. I, I go to all of these places. I don't just sort of mm. talk about the companies. I'm actually out looking at the mines. Um, and that would probably be the best place um, from now where I'm consolidating um, a lot of what I do into one place. Fantastic. We'll link to it down below as well in the description. I'm really appreciative of your time. It was a pleasure to meet you, Dr. Nomi Prince. Thank you so much. And to everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed the conversation here from the Rules Symposium. If you did so, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and leave a comment. What do you think is happening? We really want to hear from you. It helps us out tremendously. And uh, we'll be back with lots more here from Florida. Thank you so much for tuning in.